All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to welcome back Dr. Ken Keys. How are you doing, Ken? Well, it's uh, I'm doing great and uh, nice to see you again, John. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. And remind me again what part of the world you're in today. We're actually just north of you in Vancouver, Canada. So. Yeah. We do business globally. I love San Diego. Great place. Uh, sorry about the Padres, and you don't want to oh, you don't want to timestamp our video, but you know that's yeah. baseball for those people who are not uh, uh, not paying yeah, attention. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm a big baseball fan, but my wife loves it. And I was, we did watch some of those uh, games with the, uh, whoever, whatever they were called, that other team. <laughs> oh, the Phillies. That was what it was. Yeah, it was the Phillies. And I have to say, actually, some, a couple of the games were pretty good, uh, even for a cynic like myself. I quite enjoyed them. Yeah, um, as imagine. as yeah. my brother from Ireland describes, because he was over here a few years ago and we went to a baseball game. He uh, he describes baseball as a barbecue with a game going on in the background. Uh, that's pretty well when most people are on their phones doing their things. So there we go. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. with, with that distraction, I suppose we should uh, serve your exactly. listeners a little bit and a little bit better. Exactly. And Ken is a foremost global authority on personal style and behavioral assessment strategies and an expert in leadership, purpose and wellness. And what we wanted to talk today about is an interesting thing is that what do you really value? I mean, what does what motivates you and other people? And and, and I find this fascinating because I've had a lot of conversations with people and, and the idea of, of values come up. And I honestly believe this isn't a question a lot of people ask themselves. I kind of they kind of assume that they know or they assume that they have some. Yeah. But it's not a question that they typically ask themselves. They don't ask themselves. And the other part, John, is they haven't clarified what is it that they really, really value. I mean, we we have a we have a play on words. What would it mean if you could make the right decision every time? And the reason you, you can make the right decision every time is that you actually use values as a filter. Now our window as a company that's created assessments in this space is what we call behavioral or motivational values. In other words, these internal needs that I need to have fulfilled so that I can fully engage in life. And so once we know what those are, and then I've confirmed that that's what's most important to me, then I can use that as a filter against all the decisions that I have going forward, whatever that might be, it might be a job, an opportunity, a relationship, a move, uh, all of those. And we make, we base that based on the values, not just on situations, because here's the challenge. There's so many choices, so many opportunities. How do I make decisions now? I, I get confused. I get uh, consternated. I get in this place <laughs> of a conundrum where I'm trying to figure out what I'm really supposed to do. But we believe that once you have clarified what your values are, decision making is easier and it's also more correct. Yeah. So, uh, so how do you go through the, that process of figuring out your 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 values? Uh, because let's face it, from what you're just saying, is that I may I may be operating counter to what my values or my motivations really are, and operating as I said, contrary to them on a daily basis because I don't know that because that's something I don't know. Right. Well, then, of course, you're in this place, what we call lack of congruence, and that just sort of erodes your soul. So, I mean, of course, I have a bias. We have a values preference indicator assessment mm -hmm. where people go through and they start determining what are the most important values to them. We have a pre-described set. But what we're talking about here are things like, do I need challenge? Do I need tranquility? Do I need independence? Uh, do I need security? And so you go through and determine what are these values that are most important. And it's interesting that you mentioned, John, is that the next part of, first of all, I determine what's most important, but then am I living them or not? So you've heard <laughs> these people that say, hey, listen, my family's important to me, but they never spend any time with them. Or right. my health's important to me, but you don't eat well or don't take care of yourself. And so one of the challenges we have, and I mentioned this actually in our online workshop with the name, uh, the same name, is that if you're not willing to make that value a priority and to live it out, then get it off the list because it's eroding your soul each time. So as a short story, as a background here, and this is kind of a roundabout, 
is we had a sales team that was not really performing well. And the mm -hmm. sales managers most times or many times will try to increase performance by putting in fiscal motivation or incentives right. for the sales teams. And I, I actually come out of a sales background and I got in this industry as a sales trainer and then moved into leadership and all these other areas since then. However, they would never could get the team to really increase the performance. What they did is in one of our distributors, they, they then determined what were the core values of the sales team. They found out that the main values of the sales team was not monetary and they moved it around relationships. They shifted the incentives to trips and to events and they were able to move the performance of the sales team up by 41% by having values-based incentives versus what the sales managers thought they should have. So that's how powerful this can be for individuals. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. Uh, that's fascinating that, that you say that. I mean, the, you know, with salespeople, like recognition, uh, community, all of those things are, are important and, and probably not focused on, focused on enough. Um, one other challenge, though, I think today, Ken, and, and, I, and I hope that maybe if there was a silver lining from the pandemic, um, this may be it. But we live in this very strange world of uh, short attention spans, everything is simple, you know, just react, move on. And to, to actually figure out, number one, what your values are, even, you know, going through assessments or whatever, but then to figure out whether you're in alignment with those values, it takes a little bit of introspection, which is also, which is almost counterculture today. <laughs> well, it was interesting. Uh, one of my colleagues who's just recently passed away, you know, and he was in the career development field for 40 years. And I said, hey, Richard, why is it that the majority of people are not really connected to their purpose or their values or they're not clear about who they are? And he said, well, in one answer, he says they haven't been willing to do the work. So mm -hmm. you're right. It doesn't take it, it does take some effort to pay attention to what is it that really motivates me? What really inspires me? What really drives me? But if once I've got that figured out, man, I can make so much quicker, faster, more congruent decisions than I ever have in my life before. Now, most people will spend way more time in social media and on their phone today than what is needed to clarify their values and live their values out values out by just maybe even completing our assessment. So, it, you know, sometimes it comes back, John, to, you know, what's the priorities? And as you said, we have a microwave distracted society. And distraction actually lowers our performance in all kinds of different ways. So we have to kind of go counterculture, uh, take care of ourselves, focus, and then through that focus, be able to, to achieve, achieve the results and realize our, our full potential. Yeah, because, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I think, and particularly as people um you get older and be, you know with more experience you know those those val the values the core values the non-negotiables all of that they you know they tend to be pretty focused and you know not that many of them because uh, i think as we get older we go okay here are the things that really really matter so i think when somebody's approaching this i mean you're not looking to uncover like 40 different values you're un looking to uncover a, a few core ones that really kind of motivate everything well, exactly. It's interesting. You know, can you have 21 number one values? Well, you can, yeah. right? You, you, yeah. you only have, you have a top value. And when we, we have people go through our assessment, they come up with seven. And then of course we can start with five or one or two or three, but you know, every day we are constantly challenged with making decisions about what's more important, what's a priority, uh, one thing over another. So I'll tell you this short story. Uh, many, many years ago, my friend told me, listen, Ken, I want you to come to this invite only investment event on Thursday night. He says, uh, Mike, sure, not a problem. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be there. And so about an hour before I'm going to leave for this event, my wife, Brenda, calls me and says, by the way, are you coming to Tim's solo concert at the school or am I picking you up from the office? I said, Tim's concert? What are you talking about? I said, I don't know anything about it. I said, no. Tim is doing a solo in front of 400 people at the school today. He's, he's 10 years old, John. Right. Uh, and, and so all of a sudden I have this conflict. I said, well, no, I can't really come. I, you know, Mike's coming. He's, I've already, already committed to him. I says, uh, tell Tim that we'll film it and then I'll watch it when I come home. And she says, no, 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 you tell him. So these are the days where mm -hmm. you could pass your cell phone back. 
my son, of course, I was on the road a lot. So I was trying to say, Tim, this is the deal. This is what's going on. Uncle Mikey's coming. I'm going to this event. Well, I'll watch as soon as I come back. And my son, in his great wisdom at 10 years old, says, Dad, why don't you just say no? And so, and <laughs> thank goodness, mm -hmm. I said no to this investment thing. And first of all, I was wrong in the fact that there's never going to be a real estate investment opportunity ever in the history of mankind ever again. <laughs> and, and so that's that scarcity mindset. And so I went and my son just rocked it. And it was it, one of those emotional kind of father son bonding events and said, I would have really, really regretted it. So every single day we are forced with those choices. What am I going to choose one over another? And we need to kind of pay attention to that. And I think as you started earlier, you know, do we have some values that we have on the list, which might be what we call uh, obligatory or cultural? In other words, we have a, a process in our in our seminar where we have people identify their values and then they actually rank them. Are they being met or not? And I had a 23 year old in this program and every one of his values had a minus beside it or it was a negative, meaning it wasn't being fulfilled. And I said, so why do you think that is? And he was really troubled by this. And he says, my whole life I've been living what my parents want, not what I want. So there's these mm -hmm. cultural nuances or expectations. You know, if I'm a salesperson, then money should be on my list. It has to be on my list. But that for, for not every salesperson, that's not their priority. It's not, it's not what's most valuable to them. And so I encourage people that you would go on your own journey, your own discovery. You would invest in yourself to, to confirm, determine, and then live out what your most important values are. Now, we do behavioral values. There's contextual values, mm -hmm. contextual values like family, but ours are motivational values like, okay, let's say I want to have independence as one of my values. If I don't have a job or a role that gives me that independence, then it's going to erode my soul and I'm not going to perform and I'm either going to want to quit uh, not perform to my capabilities or even get fired. So we want to, as much as possible, make sure that our life is congruent with those core values. And then people ask, do I have work values and home values? And our position on this, John, is that we just have values. We take whoever yeah. we are, wherever we go. And these core values go and permeate throughout our entire life as part of our existence and where, and where we're at. And then once you've done that, there was a study at UCLA said that, you know, our stress level goes down uh, because I know who I am. My uh, decision making improves when I know because that was a, a study out of Chicago. Mm -hmm. There was a study out of Toronto that talked about that my ability even to receive negative uh, feedback is uh, increased because I'm secure in who I am because I know who I am. And if you get into values clarification for students, then they actually, their peer identification, meaning they're able to stand in their own space, their own personhood without the pr uh, peer pressure that can come with those that are, you know, in their teenage or college years. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of fascinating stuff that you just outlined there. One of the things I do think, just to pick up and again, is this idea of, of purpose. And again, you know, like values, I think purpose uh, is something that unfortunately a lot of people don't consider. And to mm. your point is, if you take a step back sometime and look at your life, look at your work, look at everything and really, really ask yourself, what is my purpose? Because you may, as in the case of that gentleman you were referring to earlier, you may you're you may be living someone else's purpose. You may be doing what you think is expected of you. You may mm. feel that these people that you're fulfilling a role. And when you look at it, you suddenly discover that none of this really belongs to you. And maybe that's why things are a little bit difficult. Uh, and there's just so many external pressures. Uh, I had a, a I have a friend, a very very capable individual, medical doctor John, and he. Um, he phoned me, he says, listen, I need to do coaching. I've actually written a book on purpose. And the gift that we're going to have today is my book on purpose. And so, you know, if you stay to the end, we'll give you the URL to get that. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what I was doing with him is coaching. I says, why do you think you're a doctor? He says, well, my dad was a doctor. I went through this. So here's all these years of education that he had. And he's, he hates his medical practice. But yeah. after we finished coaching, he says, stay centered, you know, stay in your practice. But guess what he's doing now? He's a coach to other medical doctors who are stressed. So he switched mm -hmm. out from being and taking care of patients to taking care of his colleagues who are also stressed within this healthcare field. And of course, there's been a lot of that in the last uh, few years as well. So, 
he adjusted. He realized that was really his father's expectation, all this pressure. Here he is, 40 years old. You'd think he'd be able to make his own decisions. <laughs> and just really borrowed from, and it wasn't a judgment. It was just, yeah. think about that. There's just so much external expectations. Now, I grew up on a dairy farm, if you can believe it. I'm the firstborn male, Eastern European mm. descent. So when I left the farm, my whole family said, listen, I did all of this for you. Yeah, well, right. uh, and of course, the uh, you betrayed us. You've done all these negative connotations that go with it. So we've all experienced this external pressure to be what we're not. And I, you know, you know, I, I don't believe in relative truth as much as many other people do, but I believe that we have our own truth that we need to find out about, you know, what is our calling? What are our assignments? What do I like doing? Yes, I was good at being a dairy farmer, but that mm -hmm. was not my assignment. My assignment was to help others to live, lead, and work on purpose. And that has evolved over the last 30 years of being in this industry, as we were talking off air about, you know, moving, moving into yeah. the online world in doing these kinds of podcasts, which didn't even exist, you know, mm -hmm. 25 years ago. So, but at the same point is that what are the things I can do to help other people to realize their potential? And it's just, so it's just really different methodologies, but the, the vision, the purpose has been the same for the last 30 years. Yeah. And I'm sure the, I'm sure the cows themselves were delighted too, because if you weren't that <laughs> committed to dairy farming, you probably wouldn't have been very good at it. Um, <laughs> but uh, the other thing just coming back on as well is, uh, as you mentioned about, uh, you know, being, being yourself, because a lot of people are talking today ad nauseum, if you like, about authenticity and being more authentic. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that if you really know who you are, um, then you have to be, I mean, that, if you really know who you are, then you have to be authentic. You have to be that person. Um, if you if you haven't figured out who you are, I mean, how can you be authentic if you're not even sure who you are? And maybe, as you said, you're putting, you have a work persona, a home persona, maybe you have a buddy. I mean, you have all these personas. Um, and I think that's, and I think rather than us talking about, oh, let me help you be more authentic. It's like, just find out who you really, really are. Right. This whole idea of, I've ever done, and, and I, when I was doing sales training uh, for all those years, is one of the salespeople says, I learned how to fake authenticity. <laughs> okay, okay, please. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can't make this stuff up. Yeah. So I think wrong. as you move into uh, this place where you know that you know who you are, then you don't really have to try. So one of my colleagues, and uh, you know, I had a podcast out there for several years. I put it on pause for a bit called Secrets of Success with Dr. Ken Keyes. And one of my guests, uh, John, was Dr. Tasha, who wrote the book Insights. So mm -hmm. this is an interesting concept, is that in her book, she was trying to determine you know, self-awareness levels. And that's our work in our company, self-awareness that leads to self-management, that leads to self-mastery. And values being one piece of that or purpose being in one piece of that. An interesting in her study, 95% of people believe that they knew themselves. So, John, my opinion of myself and how I believe other people experienced me and thought about me is that I believe that 95% of people believe that their opinion of self matched with or was congruent with how other people would, would they say about you. Then she had her students go out and interview people around them and say, okay, what percentage of people are congruent with my own comments? Do you know what the percentage was? It was, it was 10%. 85% of people are delusional. They don't even know that they don't know that they don't know who they are. In other words, how mm -hmm. they come across their emotional intelligence, their social intelligence is not congruent with their own self perceptions. And how I experience you is not the same as what you think about yourself or what you think I think about you. And so this is a huge amount of work. And in fact, she calls you know self-awareness the meta skill for the 21st yep. century. So values being one of them, purpose being one of them, personality being one of them, uh, skill sets being another one, all these pieces that then contribute to this clarity that you can bring your, your best self. And, you know, it's interesting. A lot of times people think, well, you're just being self-centered. And I said, no, no, the window we're going through is self-honoring. Because mm -hmm. if I know who I am and I'm yeah. able to contribute at this highest and know who I am, I can contribute at the highest level in that space versus doing something that is just not sitting with me. And we know what the last sort of Gallup study that came out is that 80% of people still are not engaged at work. 
And if mm-hmm. you think about those of us that are work in the sales field, the both of us do, is that how can I actually communicate and influence and positively impact others if I don't like what I do and I'm selling something that I'm not congruent with? I mean, this these are all foundational pieces that if I get in the zone of that, I can just uh, rocket myself to the top. And we know, you know, if you're a, a, a top sales professional and you're enjoying what you're doing you're like what you're selling mm-hmm. is that the results will be there yeah. and how many and there's there's always opportunities for people like that in the yeah. marketplace yeah i'm not I, I couldn't agree more and in fact uh i i i used this example recently because um last year i had to replace air conditioning units not very exciting um thing and you know, had a few companies come in you know usual kind of routine stuff one guy came in who and a young guy right, loved everything to do with air conditioning loved it we talked mm. my ear off and and i got and, I, and explaining everything and showing me and telling me what i did and what i didn't and really getting into it to the point where i started and i'm the least mechanical like i started going wow and i started looking at the looking at the units and everything and being like wow this is really cool yes but i used that example just because his enthusiasm for his job his knowledge sharing helping me understand how things actually worked what i needed what i didn't need was intoxicating and to your point if you hate what you do you don't like your product or you're ambivalent about it or whatever you're ambivalent about the job guess what it's going to affect how you sell oh and and people think that they can hide that no, yeah, there's there's, a, there's emotional energy around that. If you don't like what you do, I mean, hopefully it comes across that it's evident that I like what I'm yeah. doing. I've done 3,000 presentations around the world and I still like it. I mean, it's amazing. So I'm obviously in the right space at this time in my life to do it. And so are you. I mean, you yeah. love the sales space, your CRM, what you're doing there, interviewing people. I mean, our interview together was over two years ago, if you can believe That's it. That's right. Yeah, uh, I know. So, I know. Wow. And, and coming back just as a revisit, it's been awesome. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Listen, um, all of Ken's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your company. Well, first of all, let's the gift. So the gift oh, is yes. going to be at KenKeys.com. So K-E-N-K-E-I-S dot com slash pipeline. And so we produce psychological tools and assessments that anybody can get 24 seven online with a dozen of them, plus online courses that go with them. I was sharing with you earlier that we just launched our sales course. You know, why Mm -hmm. don't you sell the way that I buy, which was one of the number one rated uh, sales training programs when we did it in person. And so it really helps people to understand their selling style and buying style and how to read customers and, and read in terms of serving them. And so we just have 4 million words of content we've accumulated over 40 years to be able to serve people in the people side of the business. Yeah, listen, that's fantastic, Kim. We appreciate that. And we'll put that in the in the link below the video as well. So, And I would highly encourage you to go check it out. Hey, listen, it's time to figure out who you are. I think as my compatriot Oscar Wilde said, you know, be yourself because everyone else is taken. <laughs> I love it. I love it, John. That's great. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, thanks, Dr. Ken. Thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again soon.